specifically with the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. And I'm also right now uh, wrapping up dual master's degrees at uh, the University of Colorado Boulder in bioastronautics, which is a subset of aerospace engineering and engineering management. So thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah, thank you. All right, how about uh, Lauren? Yeah, um, so my name is Lauren. As Sam mentioned, I'm the deputy head of education and public outreach at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Um, so that's a big eight meter class telescope that's currently actively being built in Chile um, with the goal of trying to image the Southern sky, the entirety of it every three days. Um, so we're trying to look for things that are really faint but also things that are changing in the night sky at a scale that's never really been done before. Um, and in addition to that, I got my PhD in astronomy from Columbia. Um, and my research is focused on uh, theoretical astrophysics. So I like to use simulations and big supercomputers to try and explore how do galaxies form and evolve um, and what sort of signatures and do they give off in their light that we could try and detect to try and understand how those theories are actually manifesting themselves in, in the cosmos. Super cool stuff. I cannot wait for that telescope to come online. Me too. <laughs> One day. Yeah. Uh, Nora? Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Nora. I've uh, had a bit of a random walk in my life. I was a former Navy officer um, and management consultant, and now I am getting my PhD in astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Um, my focus in my research, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist who studies um, planetary dynamics, so exoplanet systems, and I do a lot of simulations and body simulations of basically just how gravity works. It's a problem that's been fascinating astronomers since Newton. So um, we still work on that um, in the present day. And um, like Sam mentioned, I also do a lot of science communication. I run a channel called Nora's Guide to the Galaxy, which you can find on like every single social media platform. And I have so much fun doing that. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be in the same virtual room with all of you. Um, really psyched about... Um, what about Dr. Nick? With... Oh, yeah. I can't <laughs> believe I just did that. Thank you, Nora. I mean, that's like exactly how I want this show to go. It's, it's going to be fluid and we're going to make mistakes and that's, uh, that's all good because we're human. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for backing me up uh, there, Nora. Uh, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... Hi, I'm I'm Nick. I'm a postdoc at University of California, San Diego, and I'm on the, uh, yeah, we got the theorists in the room. I guess I'm one of the experimentalists. I'm an experimental cosmology. I design and build telescopes and uh, camera systems specifically. And um, we also have, are working on building a telescope in Chile in the Atacama Desert um, that will hopefully also observe the sky every few nights, although not for uh, that type of science, but because we're looking at the cosmic microwave background, the uh, light from the Big Bang. And it's an uh, interesting science because we just have to stare at it for a really, very long time for it to reveal its secrets. Um, so yeah, that's what I work on, thanks. Thanks, Nick, sorry about that. I'll, we're, gonna, we're gonna have you go first next time and like pretty much every conversation for the rest of this entire show, so, so I don't do that again. All right. Well, uh, we won't do such a long uh, and lengthy introductions next time. We'll just um, we're going to jump into the uh, the first segment a little bit quicker uh, next time. But um, our first segment is uh, Sci-Fi Explained. Uh, so we're going to talk about some popular sci-fi movie and kind of tear it apart for the really really good science that it depicts and the science fiction. Um, so uh, we'll uh, we'll queue up the uh, the Sci-Fi Explained screen in just a minute. is uh, gravity. All right, so I think we got the right screen up here. Um, so uh, uh, if you if you have never seen the uh, the movie Gravity, uh, you're missing out. It's a super fun film, and um, I think it was uh, in uh, 2013 that it came out. Um, Sandra Bullock was the um, 
main actress, um, lots of other fantastic um, backup um, side characters, George Clooney. And uh, it um, takes place mostly in space. And so uh, uh, I, I don't wanna go into it uh, uh, much farther than that before we, uh, we pose some trivia questions um, for all of you out there listening. Um, so again, um, your opportunity to win some more astrophotography prints. And uh, we got three different uh, trivia questions for you. And again, all you have to do is uh, chat the answer into the chat box on Twitch. And uh, the first person to uh, get the answer right um, will win an astrophotography print. Um, I didn't mention this uh, before when we were doing uh, the mystery video, but um, the way to claim your astrophotography print um, is to uh, send us an email um, with your mailing address and we'll get that print sent to you. Um, we'll let you know if you win uh, by the end of the show and then um, just uh, send your info to info at uh, wyomingstargazing.org and we'll get those prints out to you. Uh, so the first uh, trivia question that we have um, for the movie Gravity before we start talking about it is, um, what is it called uh, as depicted in the movie when all those satellites start crashing into each other? Um, there's actually a technical name for that happening, which got depicted in the movie. So if you think you know the answer to that question, you can uh, type it in the chat. That's trivia question number one. Uh, trivia question number two is, um, what were the two different space stations depicted in uh, the movie? Um, there wasn't just one space station, but two. So if you think to know the names of both of the space stations in the video, uh, you, can, uh, you can type that in the chat. Um, and last but not least, uh, there is something special about the length of the movie. And if you think you know what the significance was uh, to the length of the movie Gravity, uh, you can type that into the chat. And that's the, the third trivia question. Uh, so just again, the, uh, the name of all the satellites crashing together, what's the technical name for that? Um, the two names of the different space stations uh, in the, uh, the video and um, the significance of the length of the video. Um, and so with that, um, I wanna turn it over to the, uh, the co-hosts and just kinda uh, get your two cents on uh, gravity, what you thought about it, and then we can start talking about some of the, uh, the science uh, there within. Should we just jump in? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, I was just thinking today, I was like, I should have rewatched this movie because I saw it in the theater and haven't seen it since. And I did not realize 2013 and now I feel old. But um, <laughs> I think this is a great movie. I think it's super fantastic. And I really appreciate the like dedication to detail they had, but they did not get all the science right. And the, the one that I probably like gets me the most because like I said I study a lot of orbital dynamics type stuff is that the, these things that they're traveling between are on very different orbits and like in space and orbits it's not just like traveling between point a and point b there's so much more involved to it and they have, would need so much more delta v and fuel and everything so that was definitely a sacrifice of scientific accuracy that they made for the plot um that, that sometimes gets me a little bit but it's still a great movie <laughs> yeah I, I think at one point they like they actually talked about um the uh the international space station and like the hubble space telescope as if they were at like the same orbits um one is in low earth orbit one is in high earth orbit so they're like they're really far apart you know, I was thinking about this a bit and I was wondering, you know, would you have in a future, perhaps, would you have multiple space stations kind of just parked up on the same orbit so that you could have delivery runs between them? Yeah, I mean, that's how me. they do it now, but. <laughs> totally. I remember when I uh, when I spent a month down at Johnson Space Center when, my, when I was a fourth year medical student. Um, we had a lecture from one of the flight physicians and he was joking. He was like, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Gravity, but that what's depicted there is an absolute catastrophe. He was like, you know, <laughs> normally, you know, a bad day on the ISS is like the toilet breaks, <laughs> you know? So this is, this is next level, <laughs> next level wild. So <laughs> just to put it in perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but next level wild, right? So 
we, we are talking about having like 100,000 satellites up in space by 2040. Um, it's, you know, 20 times what we have up there now. Um, yeah, uh, unlikely that we're going to have a catastrophic uh, experience like depicted in this movie, but it's, it's definitely going to get uh, a lot more busy up there. Yeah, I mean, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian Space Agency announced that there's a hole in their arm, um, their robotic arm that they have on the ISS that's from space debris. And I mean, it's a pretty small hole. I think it's, I don't remember off the top of my head, like five millimeters or something, but that means that it was something real tiny, but everything's moving so fast in orbit that even the smallest little things can cause quite a bit of damage. Luckily the arm is still working in case you're concerned, but <laughs> it could have been worse if it had hit something more vital, so. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the parts of the movie that really stand out to me are, um, are how quickly Sandra Bullock transitions in and out of her spacesuit. Um, I, uh, I was really curious about that years ago and it actually looked it up and apparently it takes quite a while um, to get in and out of a spacesuit. And I think she does it in like seconds and once underwater. Um, so pretty impressive. And she didn't have a space diaper on, so. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I, I remember reading about the space diapers too. She did not have a space diaper on. Um, I remember she actually had like, um, like pretty like incredible looking um, like under attire under her spacesuit. Yeah, so normally acclimatizing to be able to perform the duties like what she was performing uh, to do an extravehicular activity that requires a really like solid protocol of pre-breathing to prevent something called the bends, which is when nitrogen comes out of solution in your blood and essentially like gathers up, typically it gathers at your joints first. And so the first symptoms you experience, you know, you experience are actually joint pain, but then it can ultimately lead to death if you, you know, if it's done too rapidly. So the way that she did it would not be um, recommended. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Uh, any other uh, general uh, ideas about uh, gravity? I, I will add that one thing that is commonly cited as an error that is not necessarily an error. Oh, this might be a spoiler though, but okay, this movie is pretty okay, cool. No, we already asked a trivia. It's, all <laughs> okay. it's, so it's when, out there. They already had a When chance. George Clooney's character, I don't remember his name, but his character dies, right? He lets go and goes off into space. And a lot of people said, oh, that, that wouldn't really happen. But it was actually because this the stretchy parachute cords that they were attached to, that what they have said and makes sense is that those were stretching and that he let go so that his mass was not pulling on the cords because that would have been too much force and it would have broken them. And so that at first glance appears to perhaps be an error, but it's actually not, so. Oh, that's interesting. You know, that, that actually stood out to me when I watched the video and I, I wondered like what force was actually pulling on him, right? Because they're they're all moving at the same velocity, but I get it, it's the elastic in yeah. the- Yeah, and they, uh, like they haven't slowed all the way down yet when they grab onto it. So they're still in the act of decelerating. Oh, uh, fair enough. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, all right. Well, we um, we started a little bit um, late today. I think um, next time we'll try to spend a bit more time with our our video for Sci-Fi Explained. But to kind of keep us on track, um, I want to transition us into the uh, the next segment, um, which is virtual stargazing. And so we'll we'll uh, we'll get to that segment, and um, we're going to connect with um, a recording of what we actually did just a little while ago with one of our virtual stargazers down in South Africa. Um, he's asleep right now because they're many hours uh, later than us. But we connected with him actually during the daytime here in Wyoming uh, to do some some daytime virtual stargazing, and we're going to show you uh, some of the clips of what we were able to see in uh, in the southern sky in South Africa. And so, um, so here we go. So the plan for this evening is that um, uh, we're gonna show you some of the objects in the night sky that we get to see down here that you unfortunately physically cannot see. And we've got some absolute beauties here. We've got uh, uh, three of the, the brightest globular clusters in the sky down here. We've got some beautiful open clusters, um, things like the Eticarina Nebula, uh, which I don't think ever shows its face uh, at all up where you are, unfortunately. Um, so just to give you an idea of what I've got uh, set up here. Uh, so I'm 
in a place called Nelspruit, which, if any of you know South Africa, it's basically the the largest city, uh, city close to the Kruger National Park. Um, but when I say city, I mean it's what you guys would uh, consider a town. And just to give you a sort of very brief background about what I do and what Celestial Events is, it was sort of born out of uh, my uh, history, my career history out here in South Africa. Originally, I was born in England, but I've been over here for about 15 years now, uh, working as a safari guide, as you guys would call it, uh, out in the bush. I've done uh, guiding and also then I did a few years of training. And from that, I felt that the uh, guiding or the guide's knowledge of the stars out here, which is such an integral part of the safari experience because of the, the ambiance that we've already uh, joked about. I mean, we were literally doing stargazing last night, listening to lions roaring in the background and spotlighting an elephant that walked past the deck we were standing on. So, I mean, it's it's an amazing experience. Um, so I really felt it was uh, time to educate the, the industry a little bit better to make something more of uh, this well, amazing opportunity with the dark skies of game reserves. And yeah, we've, uh, over the last couple of years, years, we've introduced a new qualification that field guides can do now for stargazing. And yeah, I've got a company that does stargazing events for guests, training for, for guides and for anybody else who wants to learn more and also some sort of basic astrophotography stuff as well. Okay, so I don't know if you guys have seen photos of globular clusters mm. up in the Northern Hemisphere, but this is an absolute monster. I mean, it's it's about something like three, the size of three full moons, if you see all of it. You can just you can just see how massive the thing is. Yeah, that's beautiful. We, you know, the closest thing we have in the Northern Hemisphere is the Hercules M13. globular cluster M13, which just started mm. poking up over the eastern horizon in the last uh, couple of weeks, but it's nothing like this. Um, I think that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a showstopper. Stars. Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got this one. We've got forty-seven Tucana as well, which is another beautiful, very, very dense cluster. Um, but you can just you can see how massive this one is. I, I don't actually think it needs much work to bring anything out. So I'm just going to blow it all out. It looks pretty good yeah. to me. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. For a quick, um, I mean, this, I've gone down to only twenty-second exposures now, but it's such a bright object; it, it doesn't really matter. So Ben was saying about the fact that Omega Centauri may be unique among globular clusters in that it may be the core of a dwarf galaxy that got absorbed by the Milky Way some several million years ago. We also believe that the all globular clusters actually were independent from their host galaxies at some point, um, but were just basically large clusters of stars that then were gravitationally attracted by larger spiral galaxies. Um, and, and the reason we believe that is another piece of evidence that Ben already mentioned that these globular clusters don't occur in the disks of galaxies. They're all hanging out in the upper and lower halos of uh, galaxies, spiral galaxies. And so they don't follow, follow the same um, orbital mechanics that most of the stars and spiral galaxies do. Um, they seem to be captured objects. Um, the Milky Way has actually captured several other dwarf galaxies that have been completely torn apart. Um, but this seems to be the only one that we can actually still see the core of it um, remaining intact. You can see we've picked up some of that lovely pink from the, the hydrogen emissions. Obviously, this is this whole area, this massive area, is a big star-forming region. So it's the it's the Orion Nebula on steroids, basically. It's the Orion <laughs> Nebula's big brother, uh, but a, an awful lot further away. It, in terms of size in the sky, it takes up about uh, four times as much uh, as the Orion Nebula. But, but the Orion Nebula is only fifteen hundred light years away. This is about seven and a half thousand light years away. Um, so it gives you an idea of just how bright it actually is, um, or eight sometimes eight and a half thousand light years across and the Orion Nebula from one side to the other is about 12 light years this is thought to be around 450 to 500 light years from one side to the other but remember we're just looking at a small part of the of the whole thing um, and you can see all these other little fibrous uh, elements of, of uh, dust and gas here which is these box globules as they're known where baby stars are also being formed so this giant area of hydrogen is being compressed and you can see these little baby star clusters which are already forming. Uh, and there are some, some enormous stars in here. I, I wouldn't like to say where they are, but some of the, the brightest and, uh, and hottest stars uh, in our galaxy, I believe, are, are in the Carina Nebula in, gen in general.
So that is the the famed um, Korean Nebula, and we're kind of all waiting. It's the probably of all the stars in the sky, it's the one most likely to go supernova next. Um, and it potentially may even be a hypernova rather than a supernova, which again, Samuel, your astrophysics is probably better than mine, but I believe a hypernova is such a powerful thing that it doesn't leave anything behind. It's a, it's a complete obliteration. There's no neutron star or black hole left behind. It's just gone. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's is an absolutely beautiful object. It, it really is one of the stars of the, the sky down here. So you can see, I can look up and clearly see the, the hazy patch of, uh, of light. Uh, but yeah, so this was the open clusters that I was pointing out and these little box globules that you can see forming these dense areas of uh, dust and gas. And the homunculus nebula is in this blown out area somewhere. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a stunning arrangement, this. And, and so it's probably the prettiest part of the whole nebula. Yeah, as I said, with with the equipment we've got here, it's very difficult to get much into terms of detail, but you can clearly make out there that you've got this nice sort of bulbous um, sphere of light uh, with this very obvious thick band running through it. Uh, so we think, yes, there was an elliptical galaxy which is in the process of swallowing what was a, a spiral galaxy here, and then that's obviously created a huge amount of... Uh, star forming activity within the galaxy hence that all this sort of glow from the center um, but it's amazing to see just how much dust and gas is is up there but yes yeah, so you can see why it's called the hamburger galaxy certainly and you can actually pick it out so even here where i'm in bottle five skies you can you can just see it in binoculars to give you an idea of how bright it actually is but yeah some distance wise somewhere between 10 and 15 million light years away i reckon it's about 60,000 light years across, yeah, so about half the size uh, of the Milky Way. And um, so now you can clearly see that bulge, and you can see this beautiful arm wrapping around it, and the, the distortion that has occurred um, by all the spinning and these jets being blown off uh, from the center of the galaxy. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a stunning object, it's just a little out of reach of what we've got here. But you can certainly see the, the general shape in the, the photo we got this evening. Um, uh, it's but it's nicely proportioned. No, well, it's, it's a very pretty one. And you can see either what I like about this one is in terms of telescopic viewing and when we do outreach evenings and things, you know, to show people a galaxy is often quite difficult. But under the nice dark skies in the Kruger way, we're operating under portal two, portal three skies. Uh, you know, you can clearly see the structure of the arms, which is really nice to be able to actually see through the telescope. I've never, uh, but you can see lots of star forming uh, regions happening in there. Yeah, all those little brighter specks that you can see within the the spiral structure, those are the uh, star forming regions that Ben was just talking about. So each of those is a huge cloud of gas, you know, ranging from 10 to a couple hundred times the size of the solar system. And those gas clouds are becoming so hot and so dense in some areas that um, nuclear fusion is beginning and that's the, the core of a star that'll eventually be born out of that nebula. All the gas will be absorbed over the course of several millions of years, um, perhaps even billions of years, and then we'll end up with an open cluster like those um, two that we saw at the very beginning this afternoon. Yeah, so just in terms of, uh, of size, it's very similar to the Centaurus A galaxy that we just looked at. You're quite right, they say about 15 and a half um, million light years away uh, and it's also about 55 or 60,000 light years across. Um, uh, interestingly, I didn't actually realize this, it was the first galaxy to be discovered outside the local group and the third of all galaxies um, uh, to be located, sorry, uh, the third of all galaxies after Andromeda and M32 apparently. Um, well Ben, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing the, the southern night sky with us, we really appreciate it and uh, yeah, we'll definitely find to, uh, time to do this again sometime in the um, next uh, few uh, dry, uh, clear months that you've got down there. Thanks very much for, for asking me to do it, and thanks for joining.
Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, segment of virtual stargazing. Uh, we're going to try to do some, um, some live sessions at some point, um, but the, the timing is really tricky. You got you to find a place on Earth that's dark, or uh, it's got to be dark where you are. Um, so uh, following every segment of virtual stargazing, uh, we're going to do a segment called Looking Up. And that's where we are right now. And I'm here with one of the, um, the board members and the vice president of Wyoming Stargazing, Mike Adler. Uh, he's one of our other uh, virtual stargazers uh, right here in Jackson. Uh, he takes some amazing uh, astrophotography pics um, that we have on our website, one of which is uh, shown to you right now. And so we're gonna talk about uh, what's up in the sky right now that Mike's photographing. And then we'll, uh, we'll revisit the, uh, the mystery video and explain uh, what that was uh, as soon as Mike and I wrap up. Uh, so Mike, thanks for being here and um, tell us a little bit about what you're looking at these days. Okay, well, this is an image that um, <clears throat> uh, is, uh, it's a very interesting image. It's, it's in the Southern sky. And so I have a, uh, a relate uh, arrangement with um, uh, telescopes uh, in the Southern sky. And so this, uh, this image is actually uh, made from, um, uh, three telescopes, one in Australia, uh, or actually two in Australia and one in Chile. But let me tell you a little bit first of what it is. It's, um, uh, it's, it's called uh, NGC 6188, which is not very uh, interesting, but it's otherwise known as the Dragons of Ara, A-R-A. -A. And Ara is the constellation where the, this is found. It's about 45 degrees south in the southern sky. Um, and uh, the, uh, the dragon part of it, if you look in the center of this, uh, I don't think my pointer works, but Samuel can point it to it. But these two, these are, these are the dragons of Ara, and the one on the left and the one on the right. And uh, these, this whole um, uh, image is what is called a, an emission nebula. And that red, the reddish star that's just above the dragons is actually causing the uh, gases in, uh, in the nebula. In this case, it's hydrogen, oxygen and sulfur gas to re-emit the light. It excites the atoms, the, the three atoms, and then the light is, uh, the atoms relax and emit light. And in this, this is a false color image uh, done in what's called the Hubble palette. And uh, the, uh, the greenish uh, color in it is from hydrogen gas emitting. The blue uh, color, which mixes with the green to uh, make this sort of chartreuse uh, color is uh, from oxygen and the reddish color is from sulfur. And so it's a very, very interesting, I think it's one of the more spectacular uh, objects in the sky myself. And I, uh, I spent probably three weeks putting this image together because each of the focal lengths of the telescopes involved were all very different. Uh, the, the biggest, tele the, the, the overall scene was captured with uh, a Takahashi 106 uh, a millimeter telescope and uh, then uh, the next level of detail was captured by a astrophysics uh, telescope uh, at around 1200 millimeter. And then the, the detail right in the middle was captured by a plane wave 17 inch telescope at about 2900 uh, millimeter. And I've preserved the focal, I've preserved the detail in the center one. So what I've done is expanded uh, the uh, scale of the, uh, from the smaller telescopes. So this image in its raw form, well, in its final form is 160 megapixels. Uh, so it's, it's extremely large. Uh, I, I think it's several, three gigabits on the computer. So it's a, it's a monster. Um, something else about the actual image, it's, um, uh, it is about the field of view here that you're seeing is about five full moons in size uh, from uh, left to right. Uh, it's at the distance, it's about 4,000 light years away from uh, us. And at that distance, it overall uh, spreads about 170 light years in expanse from left to right. So you get some idea. This is, this is a very large field of view. Um, realizing that uh, um, a, a hundred, uh, a hundred light years uh, is, uh, is a, a distance of two, uh, 270,000 times the distance to Pluto. So uh, you can, uh, or if, you, if I divide that by 100, that would be uh, 27, uh, 27,000 uh, light years or, uh, times the distance to Pluto. So it's, uh, uh, is there are huge distances uh, in the sky. 
Now there's another object which um, is just on the very bottom of this, uh, which is kind of interesting, uh, is that one. You, um, that is, um, that looks like what's called a planetary nebula where the, the star in the middle uh, is, it's a, a star in the middle that dies and uh, uh, like the sun. And when a star like the sun dies, it doesn't, uh, it just quietly disappears. It, the uh, last of the uh, nuclear reactions end, and then the gas just sort of um, uh, uh, ebbs away and creates these interesting clouds. And they're called planetary nebulas because um, they look like they're roundish and they sort of look like planets, but they have no relationship at all to planets at all. But this is a, a, a cute little thing that uh, was uh, in the same field of view as the, uh, uh, the dragons, uh, uh, the dragon image. Um, that's really all I was going to say about this. I, I, I'm, I've been away traveling for about uh, uh, six weeks, and so I'm not actually doing any imaging here in Jackson at the moment. One of the problems is, is that it uh, doesn't get dark enough to do any imaging here until well after 10 o'clock. So, um, but I'm going to start oh, that shortly. <laughs> but I'm, in the meantime, I'm making use of, uh, uh, of the data that I have from these uh, telescopes <laughs> in the Southern uh, Hemisphere. Uh, that's super cool, Mike. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of different types of nebulae, uh, the planetary nebulae and emission nebulae. Um, and you described a little bit about the, the planetary nebulae, that they're basically the, the death throes of sun-like stars that kind of die with a whimper. Um, and then those emission nebulae are something different, right? Yeah, they are totally different. Um, they, uh, they are uh, gas and dust that uh, happens to have been... Uh, uh, combined or gravity is pulled together. And uh, th this gas and dust is what makes all stars. So uh, every star was once formed in, a, uh, in an emission in a nebula. Uh, and primarily, and the earliest, star, earliest stars were formed just because all there was was hydrogen and helium were formed from hydrogen. But over the uh, ages, uh, the various stars that have formed uh, have uh, more than just hydrogen, but uh, hydrogen and helium in them. And this, this just happens to be an area that uh, uh, is an emission nebula and lots of stars are forming uh, in this uh, area. The, uh, that brightest star, that reddish star up there is an area of, uh, of, uh, of, of star formation. It's, it's, it's illuminating the gases in the, in the image, but there's also star formation uh, uh, going on in this nebula. So every, uh, all stars are formed uh, from nebula because they, and what happens is some uh, event uh, causes the nebula gas to, to constrict even more in some, in a small area. And once it, it constricts enough and builds up enough heat uh, uh, so that the temperature is 14 million degrees Kelvin, uh, a, a star starts a, a, a nuclear reaction and a star is born. So this is, a, this is that, that type of nebula that is uh, that form stars, an emission nebula. Very cool. So, so what you're saying is that uh, Carl Sagan only got it half right when he said that we are stardust. We're actually recycled star stuff. Yes, that <laughs> exactly. Um, um, we all the things that are uh, that we're made of in in our uh, from in our sun and our solar system is probably the result. Of three stars, uh, of, uh, we're a third. Our sun is a third generation star, so there were two uh, star sets of stars, uh, two generations of stars that uh, were alive and died. And most in, in, in the the most spectacular way stars die is is, uh, is through a supernova, and that that occurs when you have a, a star something like ten times the size of the sun. Instead of just sort of whimpering away, it it, it it uh, goes up into a huge explosion and creates uh, uh, a mass of gas and dust rem remnant that then uh, uh, can form more stars uh, out of that gas and dust. And so this cycle in our solar system has gone on two times already. And, and we're the result of that, uh, uh, that, third, uh, that third creation, our sun, and the planets around the sun are all the result of, the, of Two sets of stars, two generations of stars uh, being formed and dying. That's, that's pretty awesome stuff. It was learning about that that was one of the first things that really got me interested in astronomy, actually, that 
idea of the, the universe being the great recycler. Um, and speaking of supernovae, in a couple of weeks for the next Cosmo show, we're going to have a supernovae expert, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about supernovae and um, his favorite star, Betelgeuse, which uh, might just become a supernova pretty soon. Um, well, Mike, thanks so much for your time. We're going to uh, transition to the next segment, um, which is Nobel Notes. Um, we thought we'd share a little life advice mm -hmm. from Nobel laureates because, you know, they're, they're pretty smart people. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll chat about this uh, quote in a moment and stick around after that for our special guest uh, this week, which is uh, retired astronaut uh, Scott Altman. So uh, we'll transition to, uh, to Nobel notes and then we'll, uh, we'll do an interview with, um, with uh, astronaut Scott. <laughs> So our Nobel laureate of choice this week uh, is George Smoot. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in uh, Physics in 2006 uh, for his work using this satellite, which is how he relates to the theme this week of space junk. Um, not all space stuff is junk. Uh, we learn a lot from all of the space telescopes that we have up in orbit around the Earth. Um, this one is the, um, the COBE satellite, um, which uh, helped Dr. Smoot do research into the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, I think uh, Nick might have mentioned that really early on in uh, the program um, today. This is the, the radiation that first streamed through the universe about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And it was um, Dr. Smoot's research that showed that there were actually fluctuations, um, anistropies in the cosmic microwave background radiation, um, which has since led to a much deeper understanding of um, how the universe um, first formed um, through the Big Bang. Um, so there have been several new satellites um, that have given us increasingly um, more um, detailed um, and precise views of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And um, we're, we're still learning more about that all the time. And that's really Nick's area of expertise. So I'll, I'll let him comment more on that after we share the, uh, the quotation um, from um, Dr. Smoot, which is this right here. Uh, the more we know of the history of the universe, the more we know about ourselves. Um, and, and I think that ties in really nicely to what um, Mike and I were just talking about uh, in that um, everything that we know to have um, come into existence other than the original hydrogen and helium was formed in the centers of huge massive stars and stellar collisions um, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I'll stop there and, um, uh, and see what Nick and um, the other uh, co-stars um, are thinking about um, this quotation and, um, and anything else related to the cosmos. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a meaningful quote to uh, think about just the, the history of the universe. And, and even, you know, you said there was uh, Nobel in what, 06, you said? Yeah. Um, you know, just just that recently that we're we're discovering the history of the Big Bang and understand the details of uh, the formation of the original elements and uh, still learning a lot about the formation of say the first stars and galaxies. So, you know that uh, our history or our universe's history is still uh, pretty fresh. Um, and I think nowadays, or at least me and a lot of people, grew up thinking the Big Bang is pretty well understood and that sort of thing, but it really is quite recent that we switched from, you know, a steady state cosmology where, you know, it didn't have any beginning. It was just always been the same to this uh, point where uh, there's this very unique point in time where it came out uh, has been really, really transformative. Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing um, 
how much we realize we don't know when we learn something new. I like this quote has been making me think about more than even just my like physical existence, like where did I come from as a physical human, but also just as I experience the universe and learn about it. So it's not just my physical experience, my day to day life, what I can see, what I can touch, but studying the universe really helps me understand what else is out there. So it places my personal context in perspective and also helps you think about things in a different way, like the earth that we live on, right? Like it seems enormous, but it's actually very small and something like that doesn't exist anywhere nearby. Um, and so you can sort of put these daily experiences or values that we have into this larger context and think about, you know, what is humanity's place in the universe? So it's a bit more philosophical, but that's one of the things I liked about astronomy and space was how big it is and what that really makes you think about yourself. That's super cool. Yeah, I, I, I like that perspective as well. Um, as you were saying that, Lauren, what popped into my head was a, another quote by uh, Carl Sagan. Um, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think it was something like, um, we are the universe knowing itself. Yeah, a byproduct of the universe that gets to think about the universe. It's pretty cool. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think that's sort of contextualizing, you know, humans as is a really key part of, of my field of exoplanet studies. So this is obviously a, a huge portion of exoplanet studies is how unique is the earth? How common are planets like ours? How plan common are solar systems like ours? And we still actually don't even know that yet, like, which is crazy, um, but you know, the first exoplanet was detected in my lifetime. So <laughs> like, it's, it's really crazy what, what we can learn about ourselves as a species and as, as people. And I just wanted to highlight like how amazing this the CMB stuff is because I think we see these pictures from from WMAP and Planck and stuff and they're they're red and blue and it looks like so and you think oh sure there's anisotropies but like that scale is like a millionth of it like if you actually zoomed out to to like that it's it's so insanely smooth and I think just like that's mind blowing that we can detect these like tiny things and not just detect them but detect them to like really high accuracy and learn about something that happened billions and billions of years ago. I think it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Obviously, I'd have to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing myself at it. I guess I was on that image, right? It's like Planck, Planck is the benchmark right now that our telescopes are trying to beat uh, in terms of understanding those anisotropies. And so this is just the little fluctuations in the that that pattern that, you know, kind of Rorschach test. What do you see in there? But um, I think what the temperature ones they were looking at are something like one part in 10,000. And at this point we're pushing one part in a million or so uh, in terms of the polarization fluctuations. But yeah, that's that's in just a few generations of telescope we're going you know as, as many orders of magnitude as we can with our technology. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, it, yeah, I think, you know, what, what we're able to learn in the next 10 or 20 years with the new ground-based telescopes coming online and new space-based telescopes that are gonna be launched. It, it's just gonna to like totally change our, our understanding and, and just kind of like dwarf what we thought we knew over the last hundred years in astronomy. I think the most exciting thing, at least for me right now, is that we are just at the, on the precipice of you know, starting this whole new period of actual space exploration in a really new way. And so we'll be able to apply some of the stuff that we're learning through, you know, by, through use of these telescopes and use of a whole bunch of other technologies that have evolved over the last couple of decades to really actually go to these places, you know, or begin to, to kind of experience that firsthand. It's incredibly exciting. It's like taking that adventure to the next level, you know? Um, so it'll be really cool to see. I know from, certainly from the medical perspective, <laughs> Um, but you know, just across the board, it's going to be really exciting. So, and, and certainly to echo what everyone else has said, I know for me, it, it certainly makes me feel very small, which is one of the things that I like the most about space. You know, it's the, the more you learn about it, the, the smaller you realize you really are. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, I want to, uh, I want to move us along we hopefully we'll have, um, more time for these discussions next time when we uh, when we start on time and don't have technical difficulties, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, I, I did forget to uh, revisit the um, the mystery video. Um, so I want to do that um, 
really quick. I think I've got uh, a picture right here that I was going to use to um, get back to that. This is a fabulous diagram that you can find on the NASA website, which is a great way to identify the lights you see in the sky. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the different parts of the diagram right here. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that video that we showed earlier has two different um, parts that, um, that appear on this diagram. Um, if you remember the stream of lights um, that you saw in that video, those were the Starlink satellites. And so if you haven't seen those yet, it is definitely worth um, going online and doing a search for a Starlink tracker and seeing when a launch is going to be. Uh, so you can actually see these things being um, launched and streaming across the sky. It is, um, it's it's otherworldly. It's, um, it's kind of eerie actually to see sometimes as many as like 60 lights following each other going across the sky. Um, so one of my uh, my neighbors filmed that video from, uh, from his front porch. Uh, and then just totally coincidentally in that video, uh, he also uh, caught a bolide, um, probably, you know, a walnut size piece of um, space debris, um, natural space debris, um, breaking up in the atmosphere. And it, it produced this amazing fireball. And um, I got about a dozen phone calls that night um, from all over the Jackson area, people who saw that. And we actually saw it out on a stargazing program that night as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, you can check out this chart uh, found on the NASA website. All you have to do is do a search for how to identify that light in the sky. It'll pop up and uh, you can learn how to uh, identify all those mystery objects that you see. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, if you have a cool home video of a mystery object that you want us to show on the Cosmo Show, um, just send it our way. Um, you can send us a, um, a Google Drive link or a Dropbox link to info at wyomingstargazing.org. Um, and with that, I want to move us along to our next segment, which is our guest spot with um, astronaut Scott Altman. Uh, so here we go. everybody. Uh, we're back with um, uh, astronaut uh, Scott Altman, um, who goes by Scooter. And uh, Scooter, thanks so much for being here with us. Great to be here with you tonight, Sam. It'll be a great program. Oh, thanks so much. Well, thanks for tuning in and, uh, and watching that. I really appreciate that. Um, so you've heard a little bits of what we've been talking about, um, you know, with um, um, space junk and the satellites that help us learn about um, the universe. Um, you were up on one of those satellites, <laughs> the International Space Station. Um, you flew in the space shuttles. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I'm sure people have asked you all kinds of questions about what it was like um, to be an astronaut. Um, and I'll, I'll give the, the co-hosts, uh, co-stars an opportunity to, to ask some questions of you as well. But, but I was really curious about whether or not there's a, there's a question that, that you wish everybody would ask you about being an astronaut that nobody has. And, and if there is such a question, um, what, what is it and what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, one question that I've always wished someone would ask me, but hopefully the administrator of NASA is, Scooter, would you go on another space flight? Because the answer <laughs> to that would be yes. But, Good response. Uh, yeah, but actually uh, a question that I don't really get asked as much is, you know, what do I think space flight and our efforts in space have done for the planet? And uh, you all have hit on some great things as we expand our knowledge 
I think, uh, you know, there have been spinoffs. There are the, the things that we've learned about how to live and work in space. But uh, most of all, I think it's just inspirational when you look at what we can do, when you see a rocket launch. I was down at Wallops Island this morning and we had a launch of a, a satellite on a Minotaur, a small launcher. But just seeing that rocket leave the pad and think about what it's going to go do and the capabilities that are out there, uh, it's just amazing. I was so honored to be able to work on the Hubble Space Telescope it's an amazing instrument, and it's really expanded our understanding of the universe, although it caused us to ask a lot of other questions we didn't know we had. Yeah, that's kind of how it goes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, do any of the, uh, the co-stars have any uh, questions for, uh, for Scooter? I'll tell you, it's funny hearing co-stars, because you <laughs> might remember... CoStar was the instrument we put into Hubble to correct yeah. its data. And it's also what we took out of Hubble on my mission because the optics were built into everything. So we replaced it with the cosmic origin spectrograph and brought CoStar home, which is now in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Super cool. Um, thanks, thanks for catching that. I, I actually, I, I had realized that, but I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully none of your co-stars get put in the Smithsonian yet. <laughs> I've got a question for you, if that's okay. Um, sure. Scooter, my name is Danny. It's nice to meet you. Um, hey, Danny. So, hi. So I'm curious, in your personal experience um, from your prior space, like space flights, I'm curious what you believe to be the biggest challenge that we will anticipate or that we will encounter rather moving forward on long duration missions. So, it, you know, with the expectation of Mars missions, that'll be probably upwards of three years to start what you yeah. personally see as the really the biggest challenge that we'll encounter. So uh, I do think, I think having humans in the loop is a big part of having us all kind of get behind things. Uh, I do think the, cha the challenges are relatively straightforward, you know, handling the radiation and uh, being able to survive uh, long durations of zero gravity on your way to Mars. Uh, and I think we're making progress on both those with uh, work that's being done on the International Space Station. And then there's the mental aspect of being prepared to be separated so much from your home planet for that length of time. Um, and it's something maybe we used to do when sailors left on a whaling voyage for two or three years, but it's not something that our society is used to yet. And I think that's going to be a challenge we'll need to deal with. And then the last thing I'd say is I'm hoping for some kid to make a mistake in his physics class and figure out how we can go faster than the speed of light so we can actually go to some of those places. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would love to see that happen as well. I mean, I, I'm a big uh, sci-fi fan. So if, if we ever turn that level of science fiction that we have today into science, um, <clears throat> I think that'd be pretty cool. And, and, and there is kind of a precedent for that, right? We, you know, Jules, Jules Verne and his uh, 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea and from the Earth to the Moon, that was, that was sci-fi just over 100 years ago. And now it's science. So yeah, we imagined it, and then we figured out how to do it. So now we're imagining, you know, traveling further. Hopefully, we can follow up with that. I can't wait. Yeah, I'm also a big sci-fi fan. I actually write sci-fi, and I always have, like, the internal struggle of my scientist self and my sci-fi fan self of, like, should I have FTL travel? Um, well, Scooter, thank you so much for being here. This is this is really cool, and I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping you were going to tell me that it was not cool to go to space and so that I would feel better about not being able to go. <laughs> <laughs> But you probably get asked this a lot, I guess, but I, I would love to hear your answer of like, what, what kind of is your favorite moment from your time in space? Like what really stands out to you is like that thing, you know? You know, uh, that's a, a great question because there are so many great moments. It's hard to put your finger on them, but if I had to pick, uh, and this is kind of a strange answer, but the most emotional connection that I had on orbit was on my first flight when after 14 days of flying over the US with cloudy weather and not, we came over my small hometown in central Illinois 
and I could look down from the shuttle and see, you know, the place where I was born, the people that helped me get to where I was, everybody was right there. And I just felt this incredible emotional connection with the folks there while I tried to grab a camera and snap pictures of it so I could remember it. But uh, it was an emotional feeling I'll never forget. Right up there. Uh, the, the other time that got me like that was flying over Africa at night with uh, this line of thunderstorms. You could see little flashes of lightning over here and then over there and over there. And you just felt this rhythm and it's like the planets down there breathing underneath me. And, and I felt this incredible respect for the planet as kind of an organism maybe uh, that we're a part of. Thanks so much, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what like folks like Richard Branson and, and Elon Musk are, are hopeful about that when, when more people actually get to see something like that and experience um, being in, in space, it, it's going to have a, a profound effect on their experience and their perspective on, um, on Earth. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think uh, we're right at, as uh, someone else said previously, right at the cusp of an incredibly exciting time in so many ways. Uh, from a research perspective, as the technology advance and the telescopes get better, as uh, space transportation gets better, we have human launch capability from the United States now. It's a really exciting time. We're laying the groundwork to go to Mars. Uh, I couldn't be happier to see everything that's coming. That's super cool. Um, any other questions from Scooter from any of the other? Oh yeah, Lauren. Yeah, I had a question. So first, uh, thanks for helping to install costs because that definitely revolutionized my personal field of study. <laughs> so incredible, I'm glad my we favorite got that instrument. Done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was sort of wondering, because that was one of the things to pull it back to the movie we all watched, Gravity. Like the scenes that I really connected with are the ones where she's sort of floating and you see her like, like with the, uh, the huge curvature of the earth behind her and you're like getting that sense of scale of how like small she is or how unimportant she is in the scheme of things. But I realized like even just watching it as a movie, there was this sort of anxiety of like, she's like, what's gonna, like, it's just this fear, right? Of it's so big and what, so I'm wondering like, does that ever come in for you or astronauts like a special type of human where there isn't that anxiety or like, is there a moment when that anxiety just fully transitions into excitement? So there's like hope for someone like me, like say I got to go to space and I should just go for it and I will enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think you, it's interesting because you train so long before you go, you're in simulators, you're running things, problems are going wrong. So by the time you actually launch, uh, and nothing goes all wrong. It's almost a relief. Uh, but for me, the biggest thing I was concerned about sitting on the pad was, okay, I think we're ready. We can handle whatever happens. I'm okay with whatever happens as long as I didn't screw up and cause it to happen. And so if it's not my fault, that's fine. I'll ride with it. And uh, I didn't worry about anything after that. I did when I was watching Gravity kind of stress out in some of those scenes like that, like, oh, don't open the door. Oh, he's not really there. He's dead. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> uh, that, that scene got me going as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did, did you have to like cringe a few times when you watched that movie, Scott, just because you, you like personally had experiences up there and you, like you, you knew firsthand when stuff just wasn't accurate? Well, it's kind of funny. The, uh, uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has an office here in DC and they invited me and another few astronauts down for a pre uh, showing of gravity. And I watch it and I it, you know, then they called me down afterwards. Well, what did you think of the movie? And uh, I said a few things like, well, I, the way the astronauts were portrayed and the view of the earth and the, the floating issues seemed very similar. I said, uh, I nobody ever got out of their spacesuit as attractively as Sandra Bullock did. And then I did say, as someone else mentioned already, there is a little physics problem with going from the Hubble to a space station. You know, we don't can't do that in a man maneuvering human. You can't do that on a space shuttle. You can't do that in anything that we've ever dreamed of. I said, but on the other hand, it would have been a pretty short movie <laughs> if you didn't have somewhere to go. Indeed, indeed. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, there's some of those recently released um, classified videos from the Navy that showed some spacecraft that might actually be able to do something like that, right? That's pretty wild. I don't know. That's, uh, I wonder what's going on, but uh, yeah, I never ran into that. I'll have to admit. <laughs> I don't think many people have. Yeah. Uh, on the gravity note, curious, do you have any um, favorite bad uh, movies uh, that are space-based? As I know, I've got a few from the astronomy side where it's like a little cringe to watch, but um, <laughs> can't, can't help myself anyway. Our Armageddon comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's an easy one to kind of throw stones at. And from an astronaut perspective, they made us look like jerks. So I didn't like that part of it either. Uh, but uh, yeah, Armageddon was a little bit harder to watch than some. Although they did come to JSC and uh, spend some time, but I guess we couldn't quite convince them how to make things realistic. <laughs> So Scott, we we got uh, we got a, a couple questions for you from our audience. Um, so one was, um, what was scarier, if one was at all, the uh, the ascent or uh, or descent um, in the um, the shuttle? Um, well, it's a ascent is pretty violent and you gets your attention when the solid rocket motors are burning. The whole vehicle is shaking like crazy, You're like, wow. And you, we are going somewhere. You feel that thrust in your chest, and it's a pretty wild ride. But I loved it. It was like a cat shot off an aircraft carrier, but instead of lasting, you know, a half a second, it went on for eight and a half minutes. Uh, my first reentry was in the daytime, so I didn't see any light show out the window. But my second one was in the middle of the night. And uh, I saw this glow out the window, kind of green. And then I, uh, I sort of floated up in my seat and I looked a little closer to the nose and I could see sort of uh, a yellow, then kind of orangey and I floated up a little further. And I looked down closer to the nose and it started to go from orange to red. And I'm like, oh, I'm coming back down. That looks too hot out there. I'm getting back down in my seat. So th that was probably the, uh, you could call that maybe scary. Uh, just seeing that that level of heat as you're going through the plasma at that speed. And there, there was one other question. I'm, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, but it's um, it may just be a, a question about like a personal preference. But it's uh, which ice cream is going to be the ice cream of the future? Uh, freeze dried or Dippin' Dots? <laughs> well. Uh, I hate to say this, but I know the Astro ice cream that they sell at the visitor centers is nothing we ever took with us. So I'd go with Dippin' Dots because I've eaten that and that's pretty good compared to the other. Nice. Uh, well, uh, Scott, it is, oh, we just got one more question and then, and then we'll let you go if you don't mind. Um, oh, it's, it's a great question. Um, what are you excited about working on these days? Well, I'm ex uh, the neat thing is that even though I, I left NASA when they said that I didn't fit in the Soyuz, so I didn't have a, a, a ride to space anymore, so I left. But I joined a company that's doing work with NASA, NOAA, and the Space Force. So we supported the rocket launch this morning down at Wallops Island. And uh, I've got about 200 guys in Florida who are assembling the Orion spacecraft. So we're gonna be involved when we put humans uh, in space again and send people to the moon. And I'm excited about that, to be part of that effort. That is very cool. Um, well, Scott, um, Scooter, thanks so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, good luck on your, um, your current projects. Thanks much, great to see you all. It's a great show, look forward to the future ones. Hey folks, well, uh, I hope you uh, have enjoyed the Cosmos show today, our, uh, our debut episode. Um, we're gonna end each episode with some kind of a space song. 
Uh, sometimes it might be a recording. Uh, sometimes it might be me or one of the, uh, the co-stars singing something, uh, but something space related. And so I just got a real short little acapella line for you here um, from one of my early childhood um, memories um, of watching the, the Disney Channel with Jiminy Cricket, uh, a voiceover of, of him singing um, uh, um, When You Wish Upon a Star. Uh, so, so here you go. <clears throat> when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. When your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star like dream, do. So thanks for indulging me in that. Uh, the next Cosmo show, we've got a, a recording of the uh, Disciples of Uke uh, performing their rendition of the Monty Python uh, Galaxy song. Uh, so come back in a couple weeks uh, for that. Um, we're going to have a, a special guest who's going to tell you all about uh, exploding stars, supernovae. And of course, we'll have our uh, our four co-stars with us again, and uh, we'll um, we'll bring them back on in a second, and uh, we'll say goodbye to you for this evening, and um, we hope that you um, join us again in a couple weeks. Just a, a big thank you to, uh, to all of you uh, co-stars for being here this evening. Um, that was a lot of fun. Had a few little uh, technical kinks, but we'll get those worked out. And uh, I really look forward to chatting with all of you again in uh, a couple weeks. Um, another big shout out and thank you to um, our special guest, Scott Altman, and our uh, virtual stargazing leader, um, Dr. Mike Adler. Uh, to Gavin, our, uh, our stream master, and to, uh, uh, to Maggie, our administrative assistant, who is helping out behind the scenes, um, and all the other folks who helped out with um, getting the uh, debut episode of the Cosmo show together. So again, guys, uh, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate your time. And um, thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. <laughs> see you later.